Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. Uh, a very warm welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, the topic of the discussion today is disinformation and foreign information manipulation, a challenge for democracy, which feels like a, a highly relevant discussion for any time, but perhaps this year of elections all the more so. We're joined by Lutz Gullner, Head of Division for Strategic Communications and Information Analysis at the European External Action Service. Thank you most sincerely, Lutz, for being with us. I have the great pleasure of handing over to um, a, a very well-known figure to, to most of you on the call, Eileen Cullity, is going to be chairing this uh, this afternoon session. Thanks very much, Eileen, for being available. Eileen is an assistant professor in the School of Communications and is the deputy director of the DCU Institute for Media, Democracy and Society. Her research interests concern disinformation, media literacy, education and public media. Eileen, amongst many other things, coordinates the Ireland Hub of the European Digital Media Observatory and as co-chair of Media Liter Literacy Ireland, the National Association of Media Liter Literacy, facilitated by Kamashun the Man, and as I say, I think as someone who's very well known to uh, many people on the call. Eileen, really thanks very much for being available to chair this event, and I hand over to you. Thanks, Barry, and hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this IRE webinar on the challenge to democracy posed by disinformation and foreign manipulation. As Barry said, I do a lot of work already on disinformation and media literacy, so I'm really delighted to be chairing this webinar. And as we head into election season, the potential of disinformation and manipulation is a topic that's just on many people's minds. There's lots of uh, webinars and events and media articles being written about it. So we're very lucky today to be joined by Lutz Gullner, who has generously agreed to share his insights and expertise with us over the next hour. Now, before I introduce Lutz, I will very briefly just explain the format. He will speak for about 20 minutes, will show us a, a presentation, and then we will turn to audience questions. So at any point, if you want to pose a question or join the discussion, you can use the Q&A function that you should see um, on your screen. And you can do that at any time, but just please remember that the, the Q&A and the presentation are both going to be uh, on the record and will be available as a video afterwards. And you can also join the discussion on Twitter and just please remember to use the handle at IIEA. So to introduce our guest, uh, Lutz Gullner works at the European External Action Service where he heads the division on strategic communications and information analysis. His work focuses on how to address disinformation threats and foreign manipulation or interference that targets the EU and the EU's neighborhood region. Within the EEAS, he previously served as the head of the Foreign and Security Policy Communication Team, and before that, he was the lead of the communication team for the EC's Directorate General for Trade uh, Communication. And he was also deputy head of the Trade Strategy Unit and responsible for the coordination of EU-US trade and economic relations. So with all of that experience, today he is going to tell us more about how the EU is responding to foreign uh, disinformation. So over to you, Lutz. Thank you very much, Eileen and, and Barry, and uh, good afternoon to everybody here from Brussels. Um, I wanted to give you a bit of an update about a very, very complex and uh, also sometimes slightly confusing issue because it has so many different facets uh, in its, uh, let's say, in its different forms and shapes uh, that we see it and experience it. But I will argue from, uh, first of all, a foreign policy and external relations perspective. So looking to the outside, what does this mean for our tools, for our instruments? Um, obviously, I will not ignore also what this means inside our uh, societies. Um, but uh, please keep in mind that I'm working, as announced already earlier, you know, for the uh, diplomatic service of the European Union and with your agreement. I would also like to share um, a uh, PowerPoint, if that is working, should be this one here. So what I would like to do is to show you a little bit the, the multifaceted issue of this disinformation issue that everybody is speaking about, and then focusing on, on a very specific point, uh, which is at the moment, of course, highly discussed and highly relevant. And that is, what about disinformation that is actually influence that is actually related also to an external actor so where disinformation is not so much a communication challenge a challenge for our society 
in terms of how do we organize our information environment, for example, but where it becomes a security and foreign policy issue as well. And I hope to be able also to give you very, very tangible uh, examples uh, of this. And maybe to start with just a few words about the organization and the team that I'm representing. So, uh, as I said before, I work for the External Action Service, the diplomatic arm of the European Union. And inside we have a dedicated team, uh, which I have the honor uh, to lead, uh, that is looking exactly at the issue of information manipulation as a foreign policy threat or as a foreign policy tool of other uh, uh, players, let's call it like this. And how do we deal with this? We were actually created in 2016 as a direct reaction of Russia's disinformation activities, um, in particular in the eastern neighborhood. But our mandate evolved over years um, so that we're not only looking at what Russia, for example, is doing, but any state actor in particular and also non-state actor um, and have also expanded a little bit our look beyond just the East and Russia, as I said, but also what is happening first and foremost, of course, inside also the European Union, but also in the Western Balkans, in our neighborhood region, in the Arab speaking world and uh, lately also more and more in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. I have a team of about 40 people uh, at the moment uh, with the team that we have, uh, even if we are soon going to restructure a tiny little bit. But let me go into the subject matter. And I would like to show you, first of all, on this slide, how prevalent uh, this issue is in the minds of decision makers. Um, uh, on the left side, you see that uh, in particular, uh, the World Economic Forum, which is um, obviously uh, does not need to be introduced to anybody of you, put the issue of misinformation and disinformation as the most important challenge to tackle for companies, for its members, for states, also, in a long run, if you look into 10 years time, that this is still a top 10 issue to tackle. Of course, misinformation, disinformation has a lot of different uh, forms and shapes. I will come back to this. But you show, you see how up uh, or how uh, up in the agenda, how high in the agenda this issue is among decision makers, um, not only for altruistic reasons, but for very practical reasons. Below, you see another a uh, short uh, survey from UNESCO, actually, where the issue of disinformation is particularly highlighted as a problem in the context of elections. So if disinformation, if the information environment, if you cannot trust your own elections anymore, that is, of course, a huge, huge issue. And you see here uh, just a few of these uh, of these figures. But let me speak about the terms you know, because we use disinformation, misinformation, fake news, um, very similarly kind of for one huge phenomenon which has different strands. And I would offer maybe a um, not entirely scientific, but uh, from a policy perspective, a distinction in three different strands. The first strand could be misinformation in the sense of information that is circulating, that may be false, that may be misleading, that may be even dangerous, but which has never been produced with the intention to mislead. So something that comes from sloppy reporting, for example, or from other uh, forms uh, of uh, mistakes, you know, in the information transmission, for example. The second uh, strand would be maybe the, the core of disinformation, but disinformation as a domestic uh, challenge. So as a domestic challenge in the political discourse, for example. But let's also not forget that disinformation is very important as an, uh, as an economic issue as well. Disinformation is very often used uh, to lure people to specific websites, to mislead them, um, to make them buy, invest in specific areas. Uh, there are plenty of examples, I think, that all of you have heard uh, about these elements. And then there is disinformation. So intentionally created disinformation as a tool in international relations as an instrument in the hands of actors, of state actors in particular, they're using it against, or um, it's, it's, let's call it adversaries, 
um, either for very tactical reasons, uh, that means for more short-term reasons, to influence a specific debate or a specific um, event, or for very strategic long-term uh, reasons. And that is where it gets then a real strategic issue, a real security issue, because here we think about, for example, the long-term aim of undermining uh, cohesion and trust in a society, which could lead to the destabilization uh, of democracy, of uh, procedurals, uh, democratic procedures, etc. So that is very important to have a bit of distinction because not everything that is, uh, let's say, that is um, in this field of disinformation is automatically related to external actors. It's a part of it and it depends on the issue, which part of it, but we cannot uh, subsume, so to say, one uh, issue with this very, very complex and uh, multifaceted issue. And to dwell down a little bit further into what is it exactly that we see here and how do we have to understand it, we did quite a lot of work in my team here to put, uh, to put a bit of order and to give key components of what this foreign information manipulation and interference consists of and what we need to, to factor in. All this is not an academic exercise. Uh, it could also be, and it needs to be an academic exercise at one point. And it is already. That's why, we, of course, I'm happy to speak here at the IEA. But uh, it is also a very practical policy issue. How do we design our responses? What do we need to put in place? Who should be in charge, for example? And you see here five components that are quite important to understand what it is and how we need to deal with. So disinformation in the form or information manipulation in the form of something that uh, provides or that can represent a harm, be it a uh, direct or a potential harm you know, for our democracies, for our values, for our security. Because if it's disinformation that has no harm, well, that can also be a problem uh, in a way, but it's, of course, a different policy area. The second one is this is disinformation which is not illegal. So you see from my uh, usage of a double negation uh, doesn't mean that this is legal and fine, but it's just not that we have any laws in place at the moment. There's no content that is per se forbidden. And that's why it's quite tricky to develop a policy approach, even for political uh, or for foreign policy perspectives uh, for something that is actually not uh, subject to law enforcement, for example. Then three key elements to keep in mind. Um, this activity needs to be manipulative in nature. Manipulation can happen at many, many levels. Um, can be on the content, of course. Uh, that is what we usually look at. But manipulation can also be the way things are delivered. And I will make a specific um, reference to this in a moment. But uh, that also includes, uh, for example, uh, identities that are manipulated. So false persona that are no real persons that are involved in this. Websites that present themselves as information portals that are no information portals. All this we have to, to understand. It needs to be intentional. Um, very clearly, I mean, this is not about a communication that happens to be misunderstood. It, it, there is a specific design behind it. There are specific goals behind it. And it's not misinformation in the sense as I defined it earlier. And there needs to be an element of coordination, of course. And if you take all these elements together, you have basically the ingredients for what a state actor can do with this. Um, and just to illustrate a little bit of the examples, you know, what we have here, I have picked out three elements, um, I mean, they're interrelated in a way uh, that I will not go into all details, but just to illustrate that this is not an abstract issue. On the left side, um, you see a number of websites with the name fake on it. Uh, that is a campaign, a Russian disinformation campaign, FEMI campaign, that was discovered already some time ago by an NGO, then investigated by some of our member states, in particular France, that, and also by us, and now uh, increasingly by more and more EU member states to look into kind of the exact, uh, uh, let's say, way this is playing out. And the point that I want to make here is that the disinformation 
the technique delivered uh, or the technique to deliver this disinformation, to spread it, to produce it, is not just the content. It is the way it has been done. And here it was the cloning of websites. So they have taken uh, websites like The Guardian, by the way, the German, The Spiegel, many others, Le Monde, um, have copied the website, have changed, uh, changed slightly the URL and have changed obviously uh, the content on these websites. So to mislead people, to go on these websites, to believe that this is the medium of their choice, of their trust, and to make them in the end also implicit in further spreading um, these uh, this uh, the content. So just to make the point that this is not just about a message and narrative being developed. This is a malign activity using very often specific technical means. On the right, on the top, you see Voice of Europe. Um, I think many of you have followed uh, the revelations or the investigation about a portal uh, that was set up um, by a pro uh, Kremlin disinformation, uh, um, uh, let's call it outlet uh, or circle, directly financed from an oligarch, actually a formerly Ukrainian oligarch uh, that then needed to flee to Russia. Um, it was linked in particular um, with alleged uh, payments, I say alleged because the investigation is still ongoing, to members of the European Parliament, including from Germany. So also to show that this is not just about message deliverance, not a, a delivery. This is also about the combination of creating information outlets, information portals, um, but also uh, direct uh, activities like cyber activities, or in that case, uh, the presumed corruption. Um, and the last one on the very bottom of it, and there's of course much more, uh, uh, an, if, an investigation that my colleagues carried out just a couple of days ago, uh, which shows again how information laundering is working. Information laundering is nothing else like money laundering, that information is coming from an obscure place, and there are techniques to make it look as if there is an authoritative source, a trustworthy source to all this. I will not have the time to go on all these details, but happy to expand in the Q&A. And that brings me to the, to the main actor in the room, and that is Russia, um, and of course, its security apparatus. Uh, this slide, which is from my bureau, from um, already some time ago, has been updated over time. But the point that I want to make here is outlets uh, that have been identified as not being real outlets, let's say, um, like media with an editorial policy, for example, or independent editorial policy, but uh, outlets, uh, tools, instruments, websites that have been created exactly for this purpose of information manipulation and disinformation. And many of these outlets, as shown on this uh, slide, have direct links even to the Russian security apparatus. So we could discuss a long time how exactly this is organized. It is, of course, also changing over time, but it's pretty obvious that very overt media, like and on the bottom, like Russia Today, like uh, uh, Redfish, like uh, Sputnik and many others, but also very covered operations go hand in hand in this field. So um, important to understand this whole ecosystem around it. And I very often get the question, is Russia the, the, the only or the most important actor in this field? And my answer to that would be, it is the most visible, the most active uh, player in Europe in particular. It's the best documented uh, actor where we have most evidence as well. And that's why a lot of the work on my team is specifically on these players. But there is a Russian, uh, sorry, there's another player beyond Russia, and that is China. Um, this is a graphic of Freedom House, also to showing that uh, Chinese actors are operating a little bit different in this area. We have documented some of them, uh, of these new techniques, of these approaches, but uh, we are quite uh, looking into understanding exactly how this is working, uh, what is happening, how much overlap there is between different players. And of course, there are other players also around, um, which we can discuss uh, also a little bit later. So what do we do about this? We have developed a very clear framework around this. 
and have invested a lot in understanding the methodology before implementing the policy, of course. And I think the key element that I want to underline here is not so much how exactly this works in terms of uh, workflows, etc., but to be pretty clear that this foreign information manipulation and interference is not just the content, it's not just what is being said, it's not just the narrative, it is also the way it is delivered, the techniques, tactics and procedures used, understanding what the actor actually wants, because without this understanding, we will not be able to react properly. And we have uh, not only designed, but also, well, let me say started, sounds as if we just started, but we are not only reacting, we are tackling this issue with an approach that of course also needs to be multifaceted for the very simple reason that we look at uh, at a quite complex issue um you don't need to read all this um and uh, there are publications where you can find this but important for me is here that in our way how to deal with this we need four pillars we need uh, the yellow part we need the situational awareness to exactly know what's going on who are the actors? How they are doing this? What are the techniques being used? Because without this, and then also without being able to show this and make people understand this, it would be very difficult to design policies, be it foreign policies or domestic policies on this. The second point, the red one, is the resilience around it. And excuse me, and that is of course key. We can address some of these issues directly with strategic communications, but sometimes we need also medium to long-term perspectives of strengthening our resilience, our way how to deal with this. And of course, uh, that belongs to empowering civil societies of working with fact-checking initiatives, uh, with uh, media literacy awareness in creating connections as we did, for example, with civil society or between also the EU member states uh to uh further increase the understanding awareness and possibility also to protect ourselves against this the third and blue part is regulation and that the eu has made huge progress over the few uh last years by uh adopting also a very new instrument called the digital services act which is not only for disinformation but which is designed to address uh, our online world and the way uh, online uh, manipulation is, is happening and to have a very clear um, legal instrument in all this, um, which is also accompanied by a few other uh, initiatives. And then, of course, the green part. This is an international issue. We need to use our international tools, starting from soft tools like working with our like-minded partners to quite sharp tools as we used them in the past, for example, to impose sanctions. So um, because I see time is running and I want to wrap up, but in all this, just to give you maybe two or three examples, awareness raising. You know, what can we do in this field? How can we address this and not only do the debunking? Debunking, by the way, I'm happy to discuss this in a moment in our Q&A session, has serious limits also uh, because you're after the events you're sometimes even um you're sometimes even um let's say uh, amplifying the content if you debunk but happy to have this discussion my team is operating a very very interesting awareness raising project which is called eu versus disinfo in which we have uh, collected disinformation cases so incidents, let me call it like this, of disinformation uh, that we have put in a database that we have in a way fact-checked. So fact-checked not, not in the very classical manner, but uh, to see that this is not a random selection of specific incidents. But what is much more interesting is over the years, we have collected more than, now it's nearly 17,000 cases. Um, and these 17,000 cases show you how this is working, what the patterns are behind, how the actors are working. And of course, we use this for a lot of uh, the outreach uh, with civil society organizations, with academia, uh, with journalists, um, et cetera. Not to tell them what is a good narrative and what is a bad narrative, but what are the tools that you need to understand sorry what are the what are the tactics that you need to understand uh, to build also the tools that you need to put in place 
We have put this as my boss, um, uh, Josep Borel, the high representative for, um, and vice president. Um, and uh, we have published a number of reports also in this field, but not academic reports in the sense of uh, a general look at this, but quite practically, our first report looked into this issue. How do we need to understand this new challenge? And the second report gives a very precise way of uh, how to um, put this into practice ahead of, of elections in particular. Um, and of course, our work um, with uh, civil society organizations, as you see here, is, is crucially. And before I close, because this is my last slide, let me just say a few words of, uh, about the forthcoming EU elections and our preparedness for this. As we have seen uh, election interference in the past, we would say there is a risk that it's happening again, um, be it in the European elections, be it in, in other elections. And that's why we need to be prepared. At the same time, we need to be 100% clear that we don't overestimate uh, this threat. Because if we pass a message uh, that these elections will be manipulated, people might come to the conclusion that you do not actually need to go voting because who knows, it's anyway manipulated. And that is exactly what the attackers want. This is exactly this delegitimization, this devalorization of events, of democratic processes, etc. So for us, the crucial element is really to uh, be prepared to come with a risk management approach um, to have a very clear kind of idea what we can do when something is happening. And I can assure you that this is happening in Brussels. We have closely uh, uh, kind of connected uh, the different dots here between the European institutions with the member states in being able to detect issues early, also to react uh, early when we need it. Um, because there are, of course, different faces also that we need to keep in mind uh, in the run-up of the elections, just before the elections. Let's also not forget just after the elections is also an important time. Uh, so to have all these elements prepared and, uh, and in place. And with these words, I think I would stop um, because I surpassed my 20 minutes, um, Aline, and hand back to you and stop sharing my slides. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.